It's been five years since the horrifying collapse of Lehman Brothers and the financial turmoil that ensued. How far have we come? Where does the banking system stand today? And where do systemic risks lurk now? Larry McDonald was a vice president for Lehman Brothers at the time and chronicled the events surrounding the bank's bankruptcy and the New York Times best-selling book, A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, the inside story of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. He is currently the chief U.S. equity, fixed income, and political policy policy strategist for New Edge. Larry, thanks so much for coming on the program. It's always great to see you. Thanks, Jennifer. Great to be with you. So it's been five years. Can you believe it? No, it's uh, it's flown by. Um, I tell my I tell my wife all the time, if we sell a million books, you know, I was a trader at Lehman. Uh, and if I said, if we sell a million books, we'll break even on our Lehman stock. Take me back to that day. Take me back to September 15th, 2008. What was going on in your head? What was going on around you? Well, you know, it's, it's a time when, um, you know, we've all been in relationships where uh, you have to say a close relationship with someone and then things start slipping away. And in the weeks before Lehman failed, uh, we had very close uh, discussions with Bank America uh, investment bankers uh, and one by one by one uh, people started to stand up, uh, take an extra phone call, leave the room and you could just feel things slipping away minute by minute, step by step. What's the state of the banking system now, Larry? I mean, how far have we come since that day? Well, leverage in the United States is dramatically lower. So the U.S. banks are the healthiest banks really in the world uh, in terms of leverage. Uh, the, U the European brand banks are still uh, horrifying, dangerous leverage over there. You're talking about uh, leverage GDP of three and a half times. GDP in Europe is, uh, is, is 15, 15 trillion and uh, GDP over there is, uh, I'm sorry, GDP in, in Europe is 15 trillion and the bank assets are uh, close to 50, 50 billion. Uh, so you're, you're talking about substantial leverage in the European uh, banking system. And then in China, that's I think where the real problem is, the assets that are hidden, there's a lot of hidden leverage in, China, in the Chinese banking system. How has Wall Street changed? Or perhaps I should ask, has it changed? Is the culture still the same? It's dramatically changed. Uh, you're talking about um, uh, Traders that I, 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 I at one point had close to $500 million of balance sheet. I, I knew traders that had two, three billion dollars of balance sheet. And when I talk about my book, The Colossal Player of Common Sense, is there was a cowboy mentality. The risk taking was uh, extreme. And today, traders have much lower leverage. The average trader today, the one that's trading, might have 50 or 100 million dollars versus a billion or two billion back in 2006, 2007. Well, how long do you think this uh, lower risk trade is going to continue? I mean, how, did we learn our lesson, if you will, from the financial crisis? Or does it come back to perhaps the point that the crises are going to come elsewhere? Well, we've, we've learned our le lesson on the leverage side, but the one lesson from my book, and my book's now in 12 languages, it's, all, it's a bestseller around the world, but the, the main takeaway is that capitalism doesn't work without transparency. And you're talking about a situation where the the, um, the transparency of risk still isn't quite there. So credit default swaps are still not on exchanges, and uh, there's a lot of products that are not visible to investors. Ca capitalism, think about it. The reason capitalism worked the last two, three hundred years is uh, investors or shareholders, if they can see the risks, they can make the right decisions. Um, but today, you still have a lot of assets that are a lot of risk that is not visible to shareholders and investors. Do you think we've solved too big to fail? Uh, you look at the largest banks in this country and they're still much larger than they were pre-crisis five years later. Well, that's the thing. Uh, I, I start off in my book on the prologue and we talk about the uh, Glass-Steagall Act. And too big to fail uh, still has not been fixed. You're talking about uh, banks today that are just too big they have uh, massive amounts of assets that are that are in, you've got deposits and then you've got risk taking that still hasn't been separated that's not clear that's not simple that's very difficult for investors to understand and uh, the sooner we get back to 
a separation of uh, risk taking and deposit taking, that helps investors make better decisions and that helps depositors make better decisions as to what banks they should be depositing their money in. Do you think we should reinstate Glass-Steagall? There are a couple senators who have put forth that idea as of late. I, I, think, I think so. You just don't do it overnight. But we have to go back to separation of risk taking and deposits. Like I said, the average investor uh, should be able to look at a bank and not have to worry about uh, you know tr dramatic risk taking. At Lehman, we had 35% of our net tangible equity in three commercial real estate investments. Um, that was just a colossal all-in bet on, real, on commercial real estate in 2007, 2008 that Lehman made. Uh, today, we've seen many, some of the big banks uh, are in some trouble with uh, der derivatives and uh, very, very exotic products that have lost, in some cases, five, six billion dollars, uh, and depositors couldn't see that risk. You need depositors should be, should be able to see the risks when they're putting their deposits in banks. Yeah, I mean, regulators have proposed essentially doubling the amount of capital that the largest, most interconnected banks need to hold as protection against total assets as opposed to simply risk-weighted assets. And what's your take on that? Do you think it would lead some of these large banks to actually break up? Well, that's yeah, that's the interesting thing about risk-weighted assets today is that we're kind of evolving, right, into a new era of risk. So back in 2007, eight, the riskiest assets were mortgage products and um, commercial real estate, synthetic uh, structured, uh, st structured financial products in commercial real estate and mortgages. That was 2007, eight. Today, the biggest risk is in sovereign debt. And there are really uh, highly leveraged countries today that are actually more leveraged than Lehman Brothers. Countries, countries like Greece, countries like Spain, Portugal, even Italy, uh, massive leverage in Italy. You're talking about $2 trillion of, of, uh, of debt uh, relative to the uh, level of GDP relative to debt. It's pretty, pretty intimidating. So the, the, the problem is, is that risk-weighted assets are, government bonds are not, not called risk-weighted assets. So in Greece, for example, you have a bond that, bonds that drop from par to 17 cents in the dollar. So that's from 100 to 17. That's not a risk-weighted asset? Yeah, that's a great point. And in building on that, I know that you follow 17 risk indicators. What are they telling you about uh, either the stock market or the bond market in the state of the world now? I mean, you mentioned sovereign debt earlier in the interview. You mentioned China. Well, we have, uh, yeah, we have our 17 Lehman risk indicators. We've got our newsletter is called Bear Traps. And we have investors around the world. And what we look at are the, th the things that were happening right before Lehman. It's very similar things were happening in 2011 between July 7th of 2011 and September 1st, we lost about 18% of the S&P uh, right before Lehman. So we, we see these trends, these consistent trends that happen before big drops in the market. And what we do is we, cr we try to keep our clients informed of them. Today, what we've seen is a metamorphosis, a transition. So in 2007, eight, the biggest systemic risk in the world was in the United States. Then in 2011, 12, the biggest systemic risk was in Europe. Now what we're seeing is uh, banks in Asia are very, very uh, levered to those economies. And what we're seeing is interbank trust is called really massively breaking down in Asian banks. So banks are pulling away from each other. Uh, if you, the repo rates, interbank lending rates are, are, are spiking in Asia. And I think that this is a sign for the next six months. That's where the real stresses are going to combat U.S. stocks. In other words, U.S. stocks will... Uh, do, be doing well, and then all of a sudden we're going to hit it out of left field just the way we did in 2011 from Europe, but this time it's going to come from the Asia region. So is this something, though, that could stay isolated within China, or is this something that could ripple across the world? Obviously, we're seeing uh, emerging markets uh, in addition to China that are plunging, whether it's currencies, bonds, stocks, be, as the Fed sets the stage to roll back its bond purchases, right? And that's creating implications for those economies. Well, the good news is, the best news is that we're not going to experience a Lehman-like financial crisis uh, probably for a long time because the, the problem with the Lehman crisis, as I talk about in my book, is that the strongest, the biggest banks in the world are in the United States of America, right? So, and there's more interconnectedness. Uh, 21st century financial products 
uh, structured financial, financial vehicles like synthetic CDOs and, and C, CDS, credit default swaps and derivatives. The U.S. banking system is massively interconnected with the European banking system. Uh, the good news is the Chinese banking system and the, the, the banking system in Asia is really much like a 1950s banking system where there's massive amounts of leverage, there's real estate, but there's not this interconnectedness with the U.S. and with Europe. So it, it's, it wouldn't be as a severe as a, as, a, as a downturn, but it will be uh, pretty shocking. I mean, look at in Indonesia, the long bond, uh, say longer term bonds in Indonesia have dropped uh, almost 20, 25 percent. And think about banks own, think about banks, right? Banks in the Asian region, when government bonds drop 20, 25 percent, banks own those bonds. Right. And that creates massive amounts of stress in that region. And, uh, but the biggest risk is this uh, off balance sheet, uh, what's called, um, you know, this, this um, off balance sheet lending in China, uh, the shadow banking lending, you know, the same thing that we have in the United States. It's just a much more levered, financial system in China in that region than anybody really expects or know or understands. Larry, always great to speak with you. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, and it's lawrencegmcdonald.com. Thanks. That's right, and, and the book is a great read, so pick it up if you can. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs>